Hi, everyone. Thank you for joining us today. My name is Rose Gerber. I'm the Director of Patient Advocacy and Education for the Community Oncology Alliance. Uh, before I introduce you to our special guest today, I always take a few minutes at the front of the webinar to give you some highlights about what is happening in the national oncology landscape. Um, one of the biggest issues uh, happening right now is the current administration recently released an announcement about a proposal initiative called the Most Favored Nations Model. Uh, on the surface, uh, for this might be a very new topic for most of you, not to the policy people, but on the surface, it appears to lower drug prices, but unfortunately it's gonna end up costing cancer patients a lot more for their care. And the most disturbing part of this is that a lot of cancer patients may actually just stop their treatment. Our executive director, Ted Ocon, who as you all know is our leading voice on Capitol Hill um, immediately responded to this. And we have a statement on our, on our website. And to give you a hint about what's in it and how we feel about it, um, Ted refers to this proposal as brazen and unhinged. So I really encourage you to go to www.communityoncology.org to learn more about this issue um, and to read uh, Ted's official statement and our organization's official statement. And in other advocacy news, um, we, yesterday, we released our December CPAN News Bulletin, CPAN, of course, being COA's advocacy arm. And in the December News Bulletin, we also have a lot of timely information for you on healthcare policy issues um, and advocacy topics that you can either use to just encourage your own knowledge base, to increase your own knowledge base, or just to stay on top of these topics. Um, and of course, we're all gathered here today uh, to hear from our very special guest, Dr. Kasha Patel, um, I want to tell you a little bit about who he is, even though so many people know him, uh, not just on this webinar, but basically people around the world know him now. Um, he is a practicing medical oncologist in, uh, in, in Rock Hill, South Carolina for Carolina Blood Cancer, and he is the CEO of that same cancer center. He is also a book author. He's the current vice president of the Community Oncology Alliance, and he seemed to be our president and again, um, just someone who wears a lot of hats and does a lot of things. So, you know, we're really excited to have him here. Um, but before we, you know, get to meet Kesha, um, I, I want to tell you about his book. His, his book was officially launched in September. And, and Dr. Patel, it was really exciting to be part of your, global, of your global book launch. It was a virtual book launch. And it was truly just a really impressive event. Um, I participated as an attendee. And as all of these, um, First of all, because it was a virtual global event, um, there was attendees from four continents, seven countries, there was Bollywood stars, there was the Supreme Court Justice of India, and all these incredible people are just being introduced. And I mean, this was on a weekend too. And so all these people coming in to, to hear you talk about your book. Um, but, you know, one of the things that you talk about in, in your book, and I, and I want to take a minute, like obviously the topic of your book, it deals with a very serious subject. Um, but you also talk about living life to, to the fullest. So I, I have a little funny, you know, memory to share from your book launch. So as all these incredible people are being, you know, introduced, the Bollywood actress, the Supreme Court Justice, even, you know, some of our doctors and our executive director or CEOs, you know, a, a funny song, a, well, a song popped into my mind. And it's funny to me, at least the memory. Um, and it, there was a, a country song that Garth Brooks wrote. And it was called I've Got Friends in Low Places. And it was just this mega hit. <laughs> and it's just a really great song. So all these people are being introduced and they're doing amazing, you know, talking to some of them like the Supreme Court Justice was interviewing you. And I was thinking two things. I thought, well, it's not surprising at all that Dr. Patel has friends in high places. Um, and I'm thinking, you know, this is the exact opposite of a Garth Brooks song. But, you know, Dr. Patel, you know, all, all kidding aside, you know, one of the things that everybody knows about you is your, despite all your accomplishments, you are a very humble man. You're very approachable. Um, the way that you treat people from all walks of life, you, you just treat people as the human being that they are. You don't recognize their, you know, their status or who they are. And you talk about how you, you've cared for patients from very wealthy patients to even one of the patients that you profiled in, in, in your book, um, a young breast cancer patient, you talk about her and her husband, how they had a lot of financial struggles. Um, so we're gonna learn about that today. But, I, but before, we, before I ask you my first question, I wanna go back to that, um, to your book launch. 
So one of your guests uh, was this gorgeous Bollywood actress named Sonali uh, Dendron? Bindre, it? Sonali Bindre, yeah. Yes, okay, she was, I, I feel like I don't need to say beautiful when you say Bollywood because if they're a Bollywood actress, I think that's like, a, they have to be beautiful too. But anyway, <laughs> um, she was a survivor, you know, and um, she said something that was really kind of, I don't know if anybody else picked, I mean, of course, we all pick up different things, you know, when we're participating in your book launch, but she, she was holding up your book and she said, um, she said, you know, Dr. Patel, I didn't know if I, she said something along the lines of, she didn't really know if she wanted to read your book based on the title. Right. And I was kind of taken aback because that might be like what people say, the stuff you don't say out loud, but she said it out loud. And I thought that was really honest. And then she goes on to, and you know, she was obviously in the survivorship part of her journey, but she went on to tell you that she did read the book and she found it very positive and uplifting. And I basically would like you to, to run with that and, and recognize that there will be, you know, people who haven't read your book yet. Um, I felt like a gang show host, like in that word second there, but, <laughs> you know, um, that, that haven't read your book. So how, how can someone not be afraid? Like, I think a universal experience and the cancer survivors out there might, most of them might relate. We, we all have two similar experiences. The moment of diagnosis where you're, you're literally shook to your core and your patients, you know, you met a lot of them later on in their journey, but they probably all have that same experience. And then there's a the fear of dying. So, so tell us why this book and the contents in it, what you talk about, all the patients, Harry, Annie, John, why shouldn't we be afraid of this, Dr. Patel? Because it is scary. Well, thank you very much, Rose, for a very kind words and kind introduction. Like all of the listeners on this uh, live streaming, the day we are born, we are heading towards one destination, and I hate to bring it up, and that's the finitude of our own life. We have a choice every day to make up. Do I get caught up in my anxiety about that finitude, or do I live to the fullest? You know, we, we have been given this incredible gift of life. And also we know that we've been given the knowledge that gift of life is a finite, it's not infinite. Anybody who was born in the human form has chosen to leave this body to wherever journey takes them. So my idea of writing the book was not to take hope away. My idea of writing the book came from multiple discussion with a lot of my patients whose common theme was that dark, I'm not afraid of death. I'm afraid of losing the control. And the biggest uh, challenge that we face is the fear of death. So if we are able to create a journey of hope, and even in the worst circumstances, I've seen that when patients know that they will be in full control till the last moment, they choose to enjoy the journey to the fullest. So after writing this book, I've had so many compliments and kind of uh, commendation from people who read the book that I'm planning to create a movement called Living to the Fullest and Live Gracefully. And, and, and again, recognizing that every single day that we are born, every day that we actually uh, wake up to go to work, there's a possibility I may not go back to work. When I talk to my patients about death and dying, I bring my personal example. I tell them that, you know, when I'm done with this work today, I may be driving back home and could be run over by a Mack truck not knowing where it came from. I would choose to make, do I worry about that moment or do I live to the fullest? So my, again, my, my concept in life today has reached to a pinnacle where I know that I want to cherish, I want to preserve, I want to make everything possible so that me and people around me every life that I touch have some sort of sweet and pleasant memories and not the fear of death that grips me every day. You know, Dr. Patel, um, you know, in your book, you know, you basically, uh, and you can correct me on anything that I might make an error on. Um, you tell the story uh, about death and dying through the stories of your, of some of your patients and the, the main patient, and I say main just in, you know, that's kind of the genesis of the story is a patient named Harry. Mm -hmm. um, and what I, what I think that, you know, maybe you realize this, maybe you don't, but in, in your book, you know, you, you're teaching us about death and dying 
and the experiences, different experiences that each of these patients have. And you profiled patients from your young breast cancer patient who's, you know, this creative woman who's working in the theater, who thinks she has an infection, ends up having a very advanced aggressive breast cancer. And by the way, a lot of her details mirrored a lot of my own experiences from the type of drugs to the fact that you that she was HER2 positive. So there was a lot of moments during the book mm -hmm. where, you know, where I cringed. Um, but, but when you tell the story through Harry, okay, so you're telling that story, but there was something else that you delivered to us as readers. You talk about the moment that one of your, one of your staff members, a senior staff member that you've worked for, for for a long time, who's actually Harry's spouse, mm -hmm. but you don't realize this, okay? And I don't want to give too much of the book away because I want people to kind of discover it themselves, but you are so honest and so decent as a human being, as a physician, that you are giving her this, she comes to you, you know something's wrong, you've worked with her, she's not being her normal self, and she describes this patient to you, and you don't recognize Please tell the rest of the story, what happens in that scenario, because it is it, it really paints who you are as a physician. And that's the kind of physicians that, that patients want, someone who can admit their humanity. Please tell us about that example. Thank you, Roseanne. And, and I, I really want to kind of share with the viewers of this show is that the book is actually looking at the life and death through the lens of my patient, but it actually explores my own deep-seated kind of concepts, anxieties, worries, as well as aspirations about what death looks like. So I had a colleague, in fact, two of us worked very hard to build up the cancer program at the hospital where I work in. And then we put our soul, heart and mind and to bring tumor board back in 2002. We also got the commission on cancer accreditation for the program. And one day she comes right after the tumor board and says, Kashyap, can you look at this report? And I look at the report and it says, you know, chest X-ray shows something and blah, blah, blah. And first kind of, you know, I sensed, I, I, I could, I, I still remember this slight tremor in her hands as she hands over the report to me. And, and the report had a different last name. So I, I first thought she was asking about some of the acquaintances. And after I, I saw what she had in her hands, and I said, who's Harry? And she said, well, that's my hubby. And for a moment, I mean, the, the, the kind of almost the world fell below my feet. I mean, I just felt I was kind of sinking in the ground, not knowing where I was heading. But I, I quickly realized that if I did that, if I expressed my own anxiety, I, I think I would actually make her worried a whole lot more. So I recovered very quickly and then said, okay, why don't you come to see me right away? We need to act. And we started doing appropriate workup. And then and, and within less than four days time, we had a final diagnosis that Harry had very advanced form of lung cancer. And, and, and the options were to look at doing palliative chemotherapy with lots of side effects. And Harry was a typical British pilot. You know, going back to understanding that the hospice movement came from England. England was the pioneer in building up the hospice movement. Yeah, I didn't and know Harry, that. That was fascinating. Yeah, Sorry. Harry grew up in that culture. So Harry actually was a pilot in, in, in the Second World War. And then he grew up in that culture. So he then uh, asks me very candidly about the options. And one of the days he requested me that I want to see you by myself without my wife. And, 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 and I said, it's okay because you are the patient and you, ha you have the choice to make, so you can make that choice. So he came to see me and, and, and you know, my usual self, I always want to pump hope as usual as an oncologist. I work at the odds almost like sometimes one against 10. And so I, I told Harry that there are hopes and then he would actually contact saying that yes, but hopes with side effects and and, and after a lot of discussion, he convinced me that he was not going to take chemotherapy. And I was quite okay with that. And then he brought a very important kind of discussion. That's, that's, that's the foundation of the book. He said, Doc, I'm, I'm, I'm okay. I'm 78 years old and, and I've had a full life. You know, I've, I've lived with uh, three different spouses. I've lived all over the world. I'm not worried about my own mortality. I'm worried about how people die and how will my spouse and family handle that? And it actually 
touched core of my existence. I said, yes, I mean, anybody would have the same question. You know, if, if you're faced with a terminal diagnosis, uh, the question is, you know, what happens during the process of death? How do physically kind of, you know, you come to an end point? And then, and his question was, you know, can you narrate some of the examples of the people you have kind of, you know, learned? And, and you know, I wouldn't say fortunately, but I have a habit of making home visits. And we are one of those rare breed oncologists who make home visits even now. So it has been a routine practice that if any of my patient is terminally ill, I'll try to go and put a closure to that relationship, even if they're under the hospice care. So we decided to start sharing stories of, you know, my patients who kind of, you know, left this world. And, and, and then it, it, it became a routine that uh, we have a beautiful healing dome into our practice facility. You've seen that grow. Yes, I've been that. there. Yeah, yeah. We, we, I think we, we were there when I think uh, Director Mulvaney came in. I yes. think I still have the photo of me. Yes, you, we uh, have it. Yeah, yeah. And Mary, <laughs> Mary and Chad, and, and, we... and then Dan and all of us. So, so under the same dome, we decided that we'll meet once a week uh, at noon. Wednesday is my half day typically, so we'd meet there at noon, and I would take one of the patient stories, and 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 and, and we ran uh, through each patient's kind of a very candid story as to what happened and how they chose and. And in the end, Harry really was convinced that every patient's departure was graceful, was acceptable, and was peaceful. And so the whole story is based on our conversation, but these are real human beings. I've changed the names for the sake of privacy, but every character in the book was a real human being at one stage. Yeah, and you do talk about the humanity part because it is very easy for clinicians um, and, and this is not a criticism. It's kind of like even myself, even though I'm a cancer survivor, you know, my day job, I work in oncology. So our brains have to go on to separate parts, but it, you always say, you know, you don't want to just talk about lung cancer. You want to mention, you know, you know, Harry, he was a, he was a, he was a pilot. He was a gliding instructor. He was a married man. You know, he, he made the comment about himself that he wasn't proud of being married three times. So you really um, put a lot of humanity around your patients. And speaking of your home visits, Dr. Patel, um, you know, I thought it was really incredible that, you know, several of your patients asked, you know, their family members reached out to you when they were literally on their, on their last couple of days for you to come and, and visit them, whether it was someone with an incredible beach home or another patient that you visited that it was um, in assisted living, someone who was in a, in a rural community um, and you were there and you talk about and very naturally about how some of the family members for the people that chose to to die at home or to you know leave the world gracefully whatever language people use and the the role that their pets play now i i'm not a pet owner myself but i know how much people love their pets and can can you tell um i believe it was lily was one of the lily the southern southern bell you know and uh, her her son john if i hope i have everybody correct here uh, and it's just amazing the role that these pets have played in people's lives. And I think it's important to talk about because, you know, pet there is actually pet therapy actually has a formal name now. And it's something that's being um, provided as supportive care. So I thought that was interesting, too. Yeah. So, so I'm, I'm glad you bring it up because two examples in the book, one was Lily and, and you know, she had beautiful labs. And I mean, they were really big dogs and, yeah. and you know. I was glad they were behind a gate. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so in, in rural South Carolina, you know, when you drive through some of the wooded areas, I mean, you don't know where you'll end up. And and then I think, you know, Lily, actually I, I bonded with her very well. And 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 when I came to know that she was pretty close to dying, you know, again, I, I had to go and put a closure to her. So I I, I went to see her and 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 and, and I could clearly see that the relationship that she had with her patch, and sometimes I feel that, you know, our patch know more than what we know. And, and it, it was incredible experience seeing how curiously they were looking at me, how, how kind of, you know, their eyes were really literally asking questions that I could not answer, but I could see that there was a lot of expectations. But I want to jump a little bit ahead when you bring the patch. So, 
in Harry's case, and in, I, I hate to steal the thunder from you because I mean, I think the last chapter on Harry's departure was about how he left. So one big question Harry had all the time was that I'm not sure how will my spouse Jill will handle when I leave this world. And he said, I'm not sure how will my daughter who lives in Australia will handle that. So one of the daughters was here. The other one was en route from uh, overseas. Yes. And uh, I saw Harry the night before he passed away. I, I went to see him in the evening. And the next day I got a message from his wife, Jill, that Kashyap Harry is no more. And I said, what happened? Would you let me know? She said, yeah. So... Uh, about a little past midnight, uh, Jill told me that they have two pet cats and both the cats started jumping up and down. So Jill and her daughter felt that there was something outside and, and they literally ran out of the door, I mean, literally. So as they ran out of the door, Jill and her daughter went out and when they came back, Harry was no more. And this actually endorses the fact that Harry's desire was that because he felt his wife and daughter would not be able to handle him physically leave this body, the cats might have sensed it. And the cats probably paved a comfortable, graceful transit to Harry out of this world, fulfilling his long cherished desire that he wanted to leave this world at his own terms. And his daughter who was actually flying uh, from overseas, she came next morning and I met her in person and, and she asked that, did my dad pass away this time? And, 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 and it's again, it's, it's, it's too hard to explain. And, and, and we said, yeah, I said, how do you know? She said, I felt, I was on the flight. I felt that he was up there. So, so these are really kind of very inspiring examples about, you know, how we, as a human being can continue to have some sort of control over our own timeline. Yeah, and it's really incredible, you know, um, Dr. Patel, that each of your patients kind of go through this journey. And even though they're so different in age and economic background, and even in educational levels, one of the, an, another common feeling that cancer patients have, and I know I certainly felt it when I, when I was diagnosed as a young mother, is you're, you're not, people think that you're automatically thinking about yourself. Yes, you have that moment where you, you go into a panic mode and you think you're gonna die, but then it becomes about your family. You know, that's mm -hmm. why people will say, oh, you know, Rose, you look great. You know, oh, you've lost weight. You know, you're thinking I'm looking great, but actually I was feeling horrible inside, but I was trying to look normal and happy so I wouldn't stress out my husband or scare my children who were so young. So that is a theme again with the, the, the patients are really concerned about being a burden, you know, and saying things like, I'm sorry. And I remember even thinking that, like, I'm sorry I got cancer, you know, I'm sorry. Um, but now I wanna also go back to another person who you mentioned in your book. Um, and again, you know, Harry's one of the, the main profiles, but you mentioned someone else who influenced you a lot. And this person, um, I will just mention to him as he, you have, he has a picture in your office. He was a renowned, uh, engineer in India. He's someone who influenced your life greatly. And um, of course, those of us who know you personally know that there's been an update since you featured this person in your book. And since I'm sure you know who I'm talking about, can you tell us a little bit more about this incredible man who in the book, I believe was 88 years old at the time and had lived a pretty remarkable life. Um, can you take it from here, Dr. Patel? Yeah, so that was my dad. And I think he actually had a tremendous influence. But he's somebody who's, I, I would say that everything I am today is because of him. He was born uh, in a very poor family, had lost both of his parents when he was nine years old. He migrated to a big city, worked as somebody's house servant and became an engineer. The story was that when he was nine years old, his mom got, or my granny, who I never had a chance to see her, developed pneumonia. And uh, he, together with his cousins, they get together and, and, and get a doctor, pay him whatever savings that they had, and get on a Jeep to, with penicillin, because that was the only thing that was available for pneumonia at the time. 
they couldn't make it to her because of the rains and everything had been washed away. And he felt that, you know, because of the poor road conditions, his mother died. So he starts to become an engineer. And, and as he's going along his life, I think uh, when he was in high school, his principal told him that he was such an incredible author that his principal wanted him to go to England for higher, higher studies. I can get you full scholarship there wow. to the University of Oxford in literature. And my dad said, you know, I made a promise that I'll build roads in the county that I was kind of uh, born. And, and, and to the best of my memory, he, he then became a civil engineer and he would take me to different small villages and, and I have memory of how he built road. He connected the entire 300 mile radius through the roads and then he said, now I can reassure that no mom will die because of the want of medicine. But he never had any air about him. He, he, he became successful to the point that he became joint secretary of the state for our state, he, he was chief engineer. He was involved in building one of the largest dams in India. Wow. And at the age of 55 years, one day he said, I want to retire. And I said, why? He said, well, you are a doctor. My other brother, my brother was in it. He said, I don't need to make any more money. So he, <laughs> he, he literally quit. And, and I told him that, you know, dad, do you, do you know that once you quit working, you know, the motor kids that always keeps you around will not be there anymore. He said, you know, I was born on a street and I, I can travel in public transport. So he, he decided to live his life like that. And, and one episode I remember where I became fearless about death. I think we were driving through one of the jungles where he was building the road and, and our car had a flat tire. So the, you know, in, our chauffeur changes the tire, then the radiator kind of starts leaking, so he fixes it up. And we were driving through tribal belts and there were some tribal kind of robbers who were trying to throw arrows at us. So I said, dad, what will happen? We are in the middle of nowhere. And he said, no, 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 boy. You know, you are the child of mother earth. And how would you expect a mother will abandon you? He said, any point on this earth, if you take a sphere, you're always in the center of your mother's lap. And he says, never ever worry because she'll take care of you all the time. So he was the kindest man and he passed away last year. And uh, before he died, he'd asked me about two years before he died, that did I want anything from his estes? And I said, no, that I'm lucky, I, I don't need anything. So he, he gave up everything that he had to the point that when he left this world and when I had to go and wrap up his kind of bodily affairs, 50 cents was in his wallet. He had three pairs of trousers, a blanket, a small bed, and he did not even want funeral rites. He said, you know, give my body back to your medical because I owe that favor to them so that I feel that I fulfilled my role as a human being. You know, and what an incredible, you know, life he had between, like you said, he, he literally started off, you know, very poor as a house servant to becoming this incredible, successful, you know, businessman, you know, successful family. Um, and, and what a legacy that, you know, he, he definitely, you know, left you with. And we know where you get your um, writing skills and your modesty as well. Um, I knew that this time was going to go by very quickly, but I do want to um, talk to you about one more topic, Dr. Patel. Um, in your book, you, you do a great job of, you know, every time you're with a patient, you kind of follow their lead. You know, you're very direct with them when they ask you about their longevity. You know, you're, you're very candid. But at the same time, I noticed that you very subtly will pivot. Like, you know, sometimes you're having a difficult time maybe reading what that patient wants. You know, are they wanting to, you know, get as much treatment as possible? And some of your patients did, you know, and you talked about it, they got three more, three more years of life. I believe mm -hmm. it was the teacher. Was it Julie, the teacher who, who did mm -hmm. that? Um, so can you talk about how there is this kind of differences in how patients um, will approach end of life? Some patients will say, and one of your patients did, I'm going to fight this. I'm going to be a fighter. Basically, give me everything you got. And then you have Harry who from the time he met him said, I don't want any poison in my body. And I use the word poison 
because uh, that's not personally, that's not my choice for it, but I know that you use that and certainly lots of other cancer patients use it. And believe me, I know I've been pumped up with poison. And that's mm -hmm. why I don't have the photographic memory that you do, Dr. Uh -oh. <laughs> Patel. You mentioned in your book that you have a photographic memory, which of course I think is incredible. I wish I did, but you do talk about how sometimes that can be a burden because um, even though you've treated so many patients, you know, again, you talk about your own humanity, how you do have your moments where, you know, you do get choked up choked up or you've left a lot of family events, you know, let down your wife maybe once or twice or, um, you know, your, your family members because you really, you know, you really do connect with your patients. But, but let's talk about that. The patients that choose, you know, I, give me everything and then the Harry's of the world, you know, are both choices okay? What is your feeling as an oncologist? Well, I think Rose, this is, I'm glad you bring it up because, you know, patients lean a lot onto their doctor's kind of suggestions and, and kind of uh, faith and trust. So when I meet someone for the first time, I try not to overload them with information. I slowly become part of their ecosystem. You know, the, the problem that we have in our country in cancer treatment is we, we've reduced the cancer to a piece of tissue. So if you went for a breast cancer treatment, doctor will say, you got stage three breast cancer and this is like size and I'm going to bring it down to stage one and then we'll take care of it. I look at that kind of, you know, that's a Julie, that's Jenny, that's Rose, that's Harry. So I, I put the human being first. And what it does, it allows me to kind of take a dive into their life and mind. Mm -hmm. It helps me to say, you know, what possible aspirations would you have? And then most of the time when someone says they want to do everything possible, I know that they are looking for completing an event into their life. And in that situation, I help them <clears throat> with the whatever we have. I would examples where a person say, well, I want to see my grandson graduate from what? And then, then I'm okay with that. And we've done it for people. We've done everything possible to sail them through. And also there are people who say that, you know, well, no, I mean, I'm done with my life. I've lived my life to the fullest. And my dad was one of them. He had a pulmonary fibrosis. And uh, for the last two years, he used to tell me that if something happens to me, no 911 call. He didn't even go to doctor in the last five years of his life. He said, I'm done. He didn't have a blood check. He said, yeah. when my moment comes, I'll, I'll pass sleep peacefully in my own bed. So both the choices are right. And most of the time when the patients kind of indicate one or the other option, if you dive deep into why they want to do it that way, it's because they're clinging on to something that they want to complete. And we have a role to play to help them understand realistically what is possible, what is not possible. And in all these years, in 20 years, Rose, I speak with an accent. I've lived in three different continents. I've been a Hindu my life. I've actually went to Catholic high school. I have friends who are Muslims. I have friends who are Jews. At no stage in my life, I feel that I had difficulty communicating about the end of life care or even choices, practicing in Southern Baptist Belt. So, so I think we all have innate capacity of opening up our heart. When I take my mind and intelligence away from communicating when it comes to talking about cancer and death and dying, I think message becomes a lot easier to go through. Yeah, and I just want to share uh, one more thought and then ask you a question before we wrap up. Since this is about physicians and intimate conversations, you know, I also had a very incredible on oncologist named Dr. Jonathan Paul. And I remember when in the very, very, very early stages of, of my treatment, I, I wanted her to see me as someone that's triggering a little bit of memory here. And I, and I remember taking a picture of my uh, six-year-old and my eight-year-old to my appointment. I, now, she was new to me. We're in the new stages of our patient um, physician relationship. And I showed her picture because I wanted to see them finish elementary school. And now they're successful young adults. And uh, she you know, held my hand just like you've literally held your patient's hand. Um, so thank you so much for your time, Dr. Patel. I have two more questions for you. Um, where can patients find your book or any readers out there that are interested? And is there anything else that um, I didn't ask you or that you would like to share about your book or anything that you just want to share with us? So two questions, where can we get your book and anything that you want us to know? So the book is available on amazon.com and I think it ships within like a day or two. So if anyone who wants is going, can get it on amazon.com. The, the last thing I want to comment about, I just want to share two more experience in a very brief conversation. So, so the most re remarkable but memorable event I had was when 
one of my patients, Lane, uh, she was she used to call me her boyfriend. She was 80, 89 year old and, and she had myeloma. And, and, and we placed her into hospice care. And, and one day I got this call from an attorney says, you know, I know Dr. Patel, you are not on call, but my mama is dying and she keeps muttering your name. She's comatose right now, what do we do? So we were supposed to go for a wedding. So I told my wife, I said, you know, this is important for me. I, I hate to say you go by yourself. I can't accompany you. I have to stand up to my call. So I was not on call when I went to the nursing home that she was in there. I reached next to her bed and then her whole family was there. I think her son-in-law is a professor of school of journalism, a very, very kind of a, a literate family. Her grandson is actually someone way higher up than US Air Force as well. And I, I went and, and I, I, I held her hand and, and uh, I said, Lane, I'm here. She said, oh boy, thank you very much. And she literally died in my arms. It's really incredible. And, and her family still cannot get over that moment. And, and seven years later, her son who had called me an attorney, one of the most powerful attorneys in Southeast was involved in merger of largest banks. He had advanced cancer and then he chose to go to Montreal Beach to his beach house to have the last few days. And, and I drove down there personally. Again, I had to go there because his sister told me that, you know, John needs you, he misses you. So I, I drove down there personally. And we had a very intimate conversation about, you know, the faith. So, so what I've done in this book is also explore different mm -hmm. faith perception of death and dying and how every faith perceives death. And we had a very, very nice conversation about, you know, linking his life. And, and, and the, the surrounding was so kind of uh, touching. We are sitting on the window, looking at the Atlantic Ocean and sun was setting. And, and John kept saying that, you know, look at this sun. It comes like brilliant to the full, fullest strength when I was at the peak of my career as a most powerful attorney. And you can look at it slowly sinking in the ocean and it will be in oblivion. And then I said, you know, it will rise up tomorrow again. And, and I said, you know, you'll be somewhere else in different forms. So, so this was like the most appealing moment, the mama and son, they both were so close to us. And I just kind of, you know, those moments will never get away from my life. Thank you, Dr. Patel. And I encourage everyone to read his book. I want to thank all of our listeners. I know we went a little bit over today, um, but it was such a special subject. Um, and I want to now tell you about our incredible speaker for next month. And thank you again, Dr. Patel and our listeners, if we can get the next slide. So many of you know Ted Ocon and uh, talk about, you know, someone who's high energy and knows so much about everything happening, not just one topic, but pretty much everything ha happening that has to do with policy and taking care of patients. So it's going to be an exciting talk. Um, and remember, go to our website to read some of his viewpoints um, on uh, the, the issue that we talked about, the most favored nation model, and follow Ted uh, uh, and Koa on Twitter. And thank you for being here today, and we will see you again, or hopefully you'll see us again on January 13th. Thank you, everyone.